But what was really on my heart tonight, much like I did with uh, the story of David and David's character, I just felt the Lord was, was calling me to look at Solomon and some things that are really positive in Solomon as a king. Uh, he has his flaws too, just like all of us and just like his father, David, but we won't get into those tonight. We're going to look at the positive traits of this amazing man that God used in a mighty, mighty way. Um, and so I'm going to go through those character traits. We'll also look at the temple a little bit, because in my opinion, um, where we really hit here, and Krista kind of referenced it, this is kind of the high point in the earthly kingdom, the ancient kingdom of Israel. Uh, this is, as you can remember, you know, David has been storing up uh, resources, gold, silver, bronze, precious metals, wood, stone. Uh, he has had this dream in his heart of building God a house, and the Lord did not let him do it because he was a, a man of war, and his hands were covered in blood. And so the responsibility to build the temple fell to Solomon. It takes Solomon seven years, um, but he finally gets the job done with excellence. Uh, every detail, uh, Solomon nails it. He gets it done well. He dedicates the temple to the Lord. He dedicates the people of God back to God. And we have, in my opinion, uh, they come to the top of this mountain. They've been cr climbing, 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 climbing. They get to the summit. This is kind of the summit moment for the kingdom of Israel, the ancient kingdom. And then things kind of after Solomon, well, actually the latter part of Solomon's reign, tend to go downhill, and we'll get into that later, but um, this is a really important moment because you might remember when when it's, when it's Solomon dedicates the temple is during the Feast of Tabernacles, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, in a moment here, but it's almost a prophetic declaration of the Messianic kingdom that is going to come, and the one that is going to, that is greater than Solomon, that is wiser than Solomon, uh, that's more beautiful than Solomon, Jesus, um, the Messiah, and so we'll look at some of those things too. But uh, with all that being said, let's dive into some lessons from King Solomon. I hope you all have enjoyed reading a little bit about him. First thing I want to touch on here is point number one. Solomon is a man of humility. And, and I'm going to read a couple verses as we go through here. So this is 1 Kings chapter 3. He says, uh, you were, he's praying to the Lord. Because the Lord appears to Solomon in a dream, and he asks, what does he want? Ask, and I'll give it to you. Solomon replies, you were wonderfully kind to my father, David, because he was honest and true and faithful to you. And you have continued this great kindness to him today by giving him a son to succeed him. Oh, Lord, my God, now you have made me king instead of my father, David. But I'm like a little child who doesn't know his way around. There's that humility. And here I am among your own chosen people, a nation so great they are too numerous to count. Get, grant me an understanding mind so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong for who by himself is able to govern this great nation of yours. So number one, I just love Solomon's humility here. Number one, he, he recognizes he doesn't know what to do. Lean not on your own understanding. You know, Solomon writes most of the Proverbs and I love, he's putting this into practice right here. He's not leaning on his own understanding. He realizes the task of leading and being a king far beyond me. I'm called up into something beyond my own ability. I'm turning to you, Lord. I need understanding. And so he knows who has the wisdom and understanding. That's God. And so he is seeking God in a very humble way. And he, remember when we were talking about King David, and I pointed to that one verse, 2 Samuel 5, verse 12 where David says, um, well, it says of David that he recognized he had been blessed for the sake of Israel. I think his son, Solomon, really grasps that lesson in his heart. He's, he lives it. He knows it's not about him. It's not about him being king. Oh, God, you've put me here to be king because you want to, you, these are your people. This is your nation. And they're a great nation, and you're a great God, and you've placed me with this task, but it's beyond me. I need your help. And so Solomon's tapping into something that I think, you know, as we, as we live out our lives, whatever influence God gives us uh, in the kingdom, we should be men and women like Solomon. Lord, you're calling, these people are, they're, they're made in your image. Um, you love these people, whatever you're called, whoever you're called to influence, they, they belong to God. They're not, they don't belong to us. 
And the task is beyond us. You know, we're not smart enough. We're not we're not wise enough in our own in our own understanding to be able to love and shepherd people with to God. So we need God to love people back to God. And Solomon understands this. He's got a shepherd's heart. He wants to shepherd well. And so first point, Solomon was a man of great humility. And then as we continue on, he's a man of profound wisdom. And so I want to look at uh, what the Lord says here. Right after Solomon prays this, verse 10, the Lord was pleased with Solomon's reply. He's glad that he asked for wisdom. So God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people and have not asked for a long life or riches for yourself or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding mind such as no one else has ever had or ever will have. And I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and honor. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow me and obey my commands as your father David did, I will give you a long life. Um, this is amazing. God's heart was moved by this prayer of Solomon to the point where in God contrasts, he says, look, you didn't ask for these selfish things. You didn't ask for money. You didn't ask for a long life. You didn't ask me to kill your enemies. You asked what I wanted you to ask for. He, God drew something out of Solomon's heart. And he says, you asked for the right thing. You asked for the one thing. You asked for, you asked for me to help you. And you, you tapped into something here, Solomon. So I'm going to give you the wisdom you asked for, but now I'm going to bless you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you things because I'm just, he, the Lord just delighted in it. Um, it's an amazing little verse here, but God really does give Solomon some profound wisdom. And we'll read about it a, a bit later. I'm going to tap into it uh, down at point seven. So I won't, won't belabor the point here with wisdom, but God deposited wisdom in Solomon beyond, as the Lord said, anyone else uh, not named Jesus. Okay. Uh, he's a man of king discernment and cunning. Uh, point number three, Solomon, this is the story. It immediately goes into the story of the two mothers and the dead baby. And the, the, the women are arguing over which baby, uh, whose dead baby is it and who gets the living child. And you remember that story. And, you know, it's really a, a testimony to Solomon's very, his wisdom and, and how he adjudicates that matter and reveals the truth. Um, very cunning. And, you know, Jesus, uh, in, a, in a greater way in the Gospels, as he's navigating complicated political situations, cultural situations, he knows what's in people's hearts. That's what the Bible says about Jesus. He perceived what was moving in people's hearts when he was interacting with them. And I think Solomon really tapped into that too. And this is one example that the Bible gives us of the spirit of discernment that was on this man. As he was listening to the stories, he, 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 he didn't rush to judgment. He listened to it. And he, in a very clever way, uh, was able to show what was going on in people's hearts. Um, so man of keen discernment and skill and cunning. Uh, point number four, he honored, he valued, and he worked really well with other people. Um, Solomon was, was really in a remarkable leader in some ways. And I have the, the verses referenced there. This is in first Kings chapter five, uh, verses six through eight. Uh, you might remember he actually sends a letter to, um, actually Hiram, who is David's friend, uh, sends him Solomon, congratulations on becoming King. Solomon immediately sends him a letter and says, thank you. Um, I'm building a temple. Uh, I would really love to partner with you on this project. And who can cut timber like the Sidonians? You know, you guys are the best lumber. You have the best lumber mill, the best lumber workers. We really bless you guys. And Hiram turns around and is like, this, it says, this really pleased Hiram. And he wrote back and said, I'm just blessed that you're King Solomon. And they come to this partnership and Solomon's like giving lots of oil and food and uh, lots of resources to Hiram. He's blessing Hiram. And Hiram is sending down the best timber for the temple. And it's just, uh, you know, Solomon is a very skilled diplomat, and he, he, he wants to work with other people. He plays nice with other people. Um, and, and so this is just an example. He works with the priests, and you see it as he, as he installs craftsmen, and he, 
is got a lot of building projects going on all over the, the nation of Israel. He's responsible for a lot of engineering and building projects throughout his tenure as king. And he's just, he, he blesses people. Um, you know, I'll read a verse a little bit later that just says throughout Solomon's reign, everyone was safe and everyone was prosperous. This is kind of the golden age of Israel under the leadership of a very skilled diplomat who loves people well, and he honors other people and he wants to bless them and he's receiving blessings in return. Um, all right. Point number five, Solomon is a man of patience and justice. Um, and so I have there in first Kings chapter two, this is taking place in the story that we read uh, about him where his, his grip on the, on the throne is not yet secure. Now, David has told him in the first 12 verses of chapter two, he's given him his final instructions. And some of them are, uh, he's, he wants him to kill a few guys. That's basically some of what David is saying. And Solomon is like, okay. Um, and as things play out, he doesn't rush into these situations with, with his flesh. Um, things kind of play out. He initially gives Adonijah grace, but Adonijah comes back. Um, remember, when Adonijah wanted the throne for himself, he makes a play for the crown. And Joab, the general of Israel's army, and uh, Abiathar, who was the priest under David, side with Adonijah. And so Adonijah makes a play for the crown. Bathsheba, the prophet Nathan, the priest Zadok, and David install Solomon. And so Adonijah kind of like initially comes to him and says, have mercy on me. I got it all wrong. I missed it. Uh, you're the king. I'm not. And so Solomon actually gives him initially mercy. But here in verse 13 and, and following, Adonijah comes back and asks Bathsheba, hey, would you go and intercede for me and ask Solomon to grant me the right to marry Abishag? Uh, who was with my father David in his last days. And this really pushes the anger button in Solomon. But he's also very wise in this because Solomon kind of sees through and realizes that actually this is another play for the crown uh, as he takes a, a woman who is connected to his father and is politically trying to get some more clout here. And Solomon says, that's it. I gave you grace. You come, you've come back and you're making another play. He, Adonijah's heart reveals itself, and Solomon performs justice. He does the same thing with Joab. Uh, he sends Benaiah, who is one of David's mighty men, out, and Joab killed Abner, and he killed Amasa. And this, these were both murders that were, that were on the conscience of Joab, and David says, you need to make sure he doesn't go to have a peaceful death. And so uh, because Joab is sided with Adonijah, Solomon sends Benaiah out to get him. And uh, it's an interesting story. Joab is clinging to the horns of the altar and asking for mercy. So Benaiah comes back to Solomon and says, hey, he's, he's at the altar of God. Like, what do you want me to do? And Solomon says, fine, kill him there. And, and he does. And it says, the Bible says, you know, that Joab basically got what he deserved for the way that he lived his life. And so Solomon is, is executing some justice on some of David's enemies and men that uh, did not uh, do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. You have the story of Shimei. You might remember him when David is walking away from uh, the kingdom because of Absalom. Shimei is hurling curses on David, he meets him at the as he's heading out of town. And uh, at that point, David said, don't kill him. One of his men wanted to kill him. And he said, don't kill him. He may be cursing me, maybe the Lord doing that. Uh, afterwards, when David comes back in and he's reinstalled as king, he's, he tells Solomon, hey, you're, you know how to deal with Shimei, this man who was cursing me. And so Solomon does something really interesting. He tells him, OK, as long as you stay in the city walls of Jerusalem, you're, you'll be safe. I'm not going to kill you. But if you leave, your blood is on your own head. And sure enough, three years go by and then Shimei goes to, I think, chase a couple of uh, slaves that had run away from his uh, his house. And when he comes back, Solomon says, didn't I tell you, uh, didn't you take an oath that you weren't going to leave? Well, you left. So now this is on your head and he gets rid of Shimei. <laughs> and then the final one is Abiathar, the priest, which is really an interesting story as well, because Abiathar, uh, Solomon, when he's having a conversation, doesn't kill him, he says, you were faithful to the Lord and to David and through all David's troubles and trials. 
and uh, therefore go home where you're from and don't come back. He basically exiles him. And it's kind of tragic because Abiathar with under David is a good man. He, uh, but here with Solomon, he didn't, he didn't see what God was doing in the new, the new move of God. He did not side with Solomon. I don't know what was in Abiathar's heart, why he didn't side with Solomon or because David did, but Abiathar moved. He, he had loyalties that were crossed somehow. Um, but Solomon doesn't execute him, just sends him, sends him home where he was from. So I think in this, you see, uh, he's, it says at the end of chapter two, that at, at this point, Solomon's grip on the throne was secure. And so he's, he's enacting the last wishes of his father. He's strengthening his position politically, but he's also, he's doing it in, with patience. He's not, uh, he's not just cold bloodedly murdering people. He people's what's in people's hearts are coming out and Solomon is responding. And so he, he's displaying some, some patience and justice throughout this part of the story, but it is, you know, a very interesting part of his journey. It wasn't like the transition of power was uh, overnight and smooth. Lots of human dynamics get in the mix when we talk about change and transitions and people's roles are changing and there's upheaval and human emotions get going. Um, and Solomon's a pretty calm, cool, collected character uh, throughout all of that upheaval. And you notice he didn't seek to promote himself. He wasn't going to his father, David, and saying, hey, I'd like to be king. You promised me. Other people are going to David and saying, hey, you said you were going to install Solomon, which I think is really wise. You know, don't when you come into a, uh, you know, a gathering, don't go sit at the head of the table, but wait until you're invited up, uh, up to it. Be willing to take the foot of the table. And Solomon is displaying, again, humility in how some of those dynamics played out in his own his own transition into being king. Uh, so we'll move on from there from into point six. Uh, and it's, I won't belabor this, but Solomon exemplifies a spirit of excellence in all that he does. Um, he, everything is done to the nines and it's done with beauty. It's done with precision. Um, and so Solomon is beautifying the kingdom of God. Well, the, the kingdom of Israel, he's, He's building amazing architecture. He's a man that's pursuing art and beauty and poetry. He writes some of the great Proverbs, the wisest books, uh, wisest sayings, some of them in the Bible. And so he's just uh, a, a remarkable man on a number of fronts, but he does things with excellence. Um, point number seven, he's a man of understanding and learning. And I want to read this just so that we get a feel for, for whatever reason, our, our chronological Bible did not have us read chapter four. I think we're probably going to come back to it at some point, but um, I want to cover a few verses just because it encapsulates um, this aspect of Solomon's character. Uh, beginning in verse 29, God gave Solomon great wisdom and understanding and knowledge too vast to be measured. In fact, his wisdom exceeded that of all the wise men of the East and the wise men of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan the Ezraite and Heman, Kalkol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol. His fame spread throughout all the surrounding nations. He composed some 3,000 proverbs and wrote 1,005 songs. He could speak with authority about all kinds of plants, from the great cedar of Lebanon to the tiny hyssop that grows from cracks in a wall. He could speak about animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, and kings from every nation sent their ambassadors to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. So amazing. He's writing songs. He's writing. He's really kind of a Renaissance man. Uh, he knows a lot of things about a lot of God's creation. He loves creation. And he's this naturalist who can speak with authority about plants and animals and God's creation. And these kings are sending people. We have the, the queen of sheep is obviously a great example people coming from all over the, the, the known world to listen to the wisdom of God coming through Solomon, the oracle. So a remarkable man of understanding and learning. As I referenced earlier, he's also point number eight, a man of peace and prosperity. Uh, chapter four, verse 20, the people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They were very contented with plenty to eat and to drink. 
Uh, and then Solomon's dominion extended all, over all the kingdoms west of the Euphrates River from Tipsa to Gaza, and there was peace throughout the entire land. Throughout the lifetime of Solomon, all of Judah and Israel lived in peace and safety. And from Dan to Beersheba, each family had its own home and garden. And so again, we're at the pinnacle, the high point of the ancient kingdom of Israel. And Solomon is leading his people into great a great reign of peace and prosperity. Um, all right, point number nine, Solomon is a man of dedication. If you look at 638 we're talking about the temple now and he's been working on this and it says the entire temple was completed in every detail by mid-autumn of the 11th year of his reign so it took seven years to build the temple that's a long time to be working on a project and i mean i think you know i crunched the numbers a few weeks ago on the just the gold silver and bronze the tons of gold silver and bronze that were used it was, I think, fifteen and a half billion dollars. Uh, you know, if we were to to uh, convert that to modern currency, and so he's dealing with vast sums of resources in order to put together this temple and execute it. And again, he's do doing it with excellence and dedication. Um, we know Solomon's a man of prayer. I'm not going to read the whole prayer there. We read it as we went through uh, this amazing moment. As Solomon is dedicating the temple, um, he's praying. What's remarkable about this moment is God's presence fills the temple. If you can imagine, it says that God comes down in the cloud. The Shekinah glory of God comes and fills the house of God to the point where the priests cannot perform their duties. And Solomon is, this is during the dedication. This is the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, this is the dream of God. God wants to dwell forever with humanity. And here's his house. He doesn't need a house, but he decides to inhabit this house that's been made for him. Solomon is praying these amazing prayers. Um, we just read earlier when he asked the Lord for a wise and discerning heart. He's a man that's got a prayer relationship with the Lord. Um, Point number 11, he's a man of covenant. He understands who God is. And you can see this in his language as he prays. Like He says things like, and when, when we sin uh, and we, we come to you and pray, and who hasn't sinned? Uh, we, and we, we, we've asked that you would have mercy on us and forgive us of our sins. He understands who God is. He understands God's heart for mercy. He understands in the, in the same way that David understood God is a faithful God of covenant and that you know, when David would sin, he would say, like he says in Psalm 51, against you and you alone have I sinned, Lord. Um, Solomon understands some of those same dynamics and is calling his people and dedicating the people of Israel uh, to, to walking with God in humility and confession of sin. And he's beseeching God by, his by virtue of his character to have mercy on his people. And so, you know, we see this in, uh, in Solomon's leadership as king. And the 12th point, um, Solomon is a man of prophetic vision and purpose. And so I want to read this verse. It really jumped out at me in Solomon's prayer. And it's verse 41, chapter 8. And he says, uh, when foreigners hear of you and come from distant lands to worship your great name, for they will hear of you and your mighty miracles and your power. And they pray towards this temple. Hear from heaven where you live and grant what they ask of you. Then all the people of, of the earth will come to know and fear you just as your own people Israel do. I, I love that. Solomon understands God's heart for the nations. He understands that people are going to be drawn to the God of Israel. And he's making, in his prayer of dedication of the temple, he's making a way for the foreigners that are going to come to be connected to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's no accident that this is being dedicated during the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles, is the seventh uh, feast in the feast cycle. It's the last feast of the year. And it really, I mean, it does look back to how God cared for his people throughout their wilderness, and they lived in tents for 40 years in the desert. 
So there's a past application of Sukkot, but there's also a future uh, application of Sukkot, and that is God will tabernacle with his people forever. And Jesus talks about the table of Abraham. Isaiah talks about the wedding feast in Isaiah 25. We know that Jesus is the bridegroom coming back. And, and here Solomon is kind of echoing this heart, this purpose of God that he's connected to of, you know, this isn't just for Israel. God wants the nations to come in and be grafted in. Um, and he's seeing that vision and he's prophesying God's heart as the king of Israel. And so Sukkot is the perfect time of year to dedicate the temple. It's not an accident that it happens right during this feast um, because it's pointing, it's a blessing in the ancient kingdom of Israel, but it was prophesying a time. The great consummation of the kingdom will be the return of the greater Solomon, Jesus, the Messiah, and all the nations, every tribe and tongue, remnant from every family will be grafted in to his leadership. And as wise as Solomon uh, was, Jesus is wiser. As beautiful as the ancient kingdom of Israel was, the, the messianic kingdom of Messiah is going to be more beautiful. It's going to be the greater manifestation. But here Solomon is walking in this prophetic vision, the dream of God. He's letting the dream of God touch his heart and inform his leadership and inform what is coming out of his mouth. So those are 12 nuggets that I felt the Lord give me from, the, from Solomon to this point. Um, he doesn't, he's not perfect. We're going to see some other things in his life as we carry forward, but, um, what an amazing man of God that is used by God to lead Israel into an amazing time of peace and prosperity. And as we kind of consecrate the temple, I want to just touch base really briefly on what is, what do these symbols mean in a temple? Okay. And what do they represent? And this isn't necessarily exhaustive, but these are just a few thoughts. Um, you know, the wash basin, you have all of these gallons of water uh, there in the courtyard as the priests were required to wash themselves. And it's mirrored. It's a mirrored labor. Uh, so you can see yourself. Uh, it represents purity. Uh, it represents a picture of baptism. Um, it's washing of the word. You know, we're told husbands are commanded to wash their wives with the water of the word of God. And if husbands are to do that with their earthly wives, then we are the bride of Christ. Christ is washing us, the body of Christ, with his word. And so as priests, we're a nation of priests, a holy nation. We're to be washed with the water of the word, and it can, it can clear out and renew our mind. Uh, God wants truth in the inmost being. And so I think the wash basin is, is yes, washing, cleansing from sin, but it's also healing and, and washing us and and preparing us to, to have the word of God um, in a priestly function. Uh, the brazen altar, you, you know, this is where all the sacrifices were going on. And even in what we just read about uh, Solomon, it said there were so many sacrifices, they were, you couldn't even count them, how many bulls and goats and sheep. Um, and so you have this really uh, stark picture of the consequence of sin, that God's holy and without there's, there's no remission or forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And so as we were looking at the priestly ordinances from Leviticus and all of that's going to be, that's happening at the temple, there is so much sacrifice going on all the time for sin, uh, peace offerings. And there's so many different offerings being, being given up to the Lord at the brazen altar. You were confronted daily with the reality that God is holy and sin has a cost. The wages of sin is death. And so you can't come into the presence of God without dealing with sin. Um, and that, that really uh, creates in us humility. That It's not by anything that we've done. We're not awesome. Uh, the relationship we have with God is not because we've earned anything. As Paul says in Ephesians, this was the free grace of God. Faith is a gift from God by his grace for us. We were all, according to Ephesians 2, serving Satan, the prince and power of the air, according to our carnal natures. And so the brazen altar is a reminder that sin has to be dealt with. And of course, God has dealt with sin for all time through the altar of all time, which was the cross. And Christ was our perfect sacrifice uh, given up for us for the remission of sins. When you go into the temple, you have the bread of the presence or the table of showbread. 
uh, this really represents dependency on God's word. Re remember, we don't live by, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so here's this bread that sits on these tables. There's 12 loaves representing the tribes of Israel, which represents community, fellowship, family, dependence on God. It's a reference to manna. Um, God's our provider, Jehovah uh, Yireh, our provider. So uh, there's the table of showbread. The altar of incense is burning according to uh, just the specific um, recipe for the oil to be burned there. It's going up 24 hours a day. This fragrance is rising up to the Lord. Uh, and that just represents prayer and worship uh, because God's worthy. He's worthy. What's happening around the throne room, and we have to remember that in the letter to the Hebrews says that everything that God gave Moses was a pattern in heaven. There's a temple in heaven. God downloaded to Moses uh, the true temple. <laughs> he gave him a, a picture, a blueprint of something that exists in the spirit. And so uh, this is uh, around his throne are elders and creatures worshiping God 24-7, all the time declaring, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And so the altar of incense is this uh, fragrance arising of just declaring the worth and the beauty and the holiness of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord, Jesus, the Messiah. We come to the lampstand, which is seven. We have a menorah, which would be seven uh, lampstands, or what am I trying to say? Seven branches on a lampstand. This represents the sevenfold spirit of God. Uh, it represents illumination, wisdom, instruction, God's word. You know, Jesus said he was the light. Uh, he is the light of the world. And so light represents God. In fact, God is clothed in light, inapproachable light. If we were to go before God in our human flesh, no, we, we would be we would be crucified. Um, he's, 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 he's surrounded in unapproachable light. And so light represents his presence represents instruction and teaching uh, his word. And so it's burning all the time there as well. And then finally, we have the Ark of the Covenant, which represents God's presence, his covenantal faithfulness inside of the Ark was the Ten Commandments, um, his word. We have the manna, which was to, to a, a, a memorial of how he fed and cared for his people uh, in the wilderness, and Aaron's staff that budded. Um, and so over the ark, the, the cover of the ark was the mercy seat, uh, which was sprinkled once a year by the high priest who would go in on Yom Kippur and sprinkle blood for the national sins of Israel on the mercy seat. Um, and separating uh, was the veil. Uh, the veil was separating the, the most holy place from the holy of holies where the ark was. And so this curtain was massive. A lot of people think it was like, like a bridal veil, very thin, but no, it was more like six inches thick, uh, a, a massive woven carpet. And so when the veil is torn uh, during the crucifixion, um, that was quite a statement from God. It wasn't like a bridal veil being gently ripped. It was this massive curtain being rent in two and the father saying, everyone can come into my presence now because of my son. It pleased, like Isaiah 53, it pleased God to crush him in order to bring many to glory. God's heart uh, was that he would bring many sons and daughters to glory through the, the suffering of Jesus as the servant who came, uh, the lamb who came to take away the sins of the world. So just a few thoughts on the temple as we just dedicated it in our reading this week. Um, and now I want to open up the uh, time of conversation to everyone online. Um, would love to hear, you can answer any of these four questions. Um, well, I have four questions, but we have, the first one is, what did you learn about the nature and character of God over the course of this week's portion? Uh, number two, did, did anything stir in your heart over the portion of Psalms that we read through this week? I didn't even touch on the Psalms and there were so many good ones. Um, but I felt the Lord directed me to Solomon. So if any of you had, had a Psalm that really spoke to you, uh, some revelation that came to your heart, feel free to comment on that. Uh, what lessons from Solomon's story are most inspiring to you? Maybe there's a bunch of character traits that I didn't touch on that you really think are important. Would love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, and finally, 
what is something new that you've never seen before uh, that God showed you from his word this week? So any one of those four are fair game and would love to hear your thoughts or ask if you have any questions. Not that we have all the answers, but we'd be happy to um, just listen and dialogue together uh, over the content of uh, this week's scripture portion. So I will go on mute and whoever would like to start us off, feel free. Hey man, what a blessing and to be here every Monday. I, I honestly look forward to every Mondays for Bible studies. Um, for me, uh, you know, when I, when I study scripture, um, I, I, I like to see uh, what God's intent uh, for, for creation uh, um, has always been. Um, you know, uh, and when I look at Solomon and his life uh, uh, in, in its entirety, um, uh, how he really appealed to God, as you mentioned, um, and the first part of this uh, of, of your presentation, Pastor, is that, you know, God really loved what he asked for. And so that says a lot about uh, uh, the kind of leader that God likes, you know, um, and you see that when 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 there is a good leader, uh, the nation flourishes. Um, uh, so, I mean, to me, that that that. Every leader should take a page from Solomon's book to have a love for the people rather than a love for themselves. And I say this because, again, I come from a nation um, where um, we see it not flourishing, not because we don't have the resources for the nation to flourish, because leaders uh, take all the wealth for themselves. And so therefore the people suffer. Um, and so when I when I look at Solomon, my prayer is that, you know, um, um, leaders would would love the people more than the position, and that is exactly what uh, Solomon did. He loved God's people more than the title, more than the position. I mean, and then with that said, uh, you know, God blessed him so much, and he just took me to scripture that said, to whom much is given, much is required. You see, Solomon fulfilled that. He was given much, and he didn't hoard it to himself. He gave it back to the people of God, because God saw that quality in him. God knew that had he given him much, he would use what he'd been given to lead his people, because he, he asked for wisdom to lead God's people. So, uh, you know, um, I mean, you don't I, I, you don't go with it with the intent that God will bless you more. You go with it with the intent to to be a blessing to others, and God can truly use you as a channel of, of blessings. So um, that's that's the part that I really took from Solomon's life. Uh, what it means to be a leader: uh, put the people of God first before yourself, and you might you, you will be a beneficiary. Um, yeah, Amen. Thank you, Terrence. God bless you, brother. Amen. I just want to say, you know, one of the things that really stands out to me is his humility in public before the people. Um, and I think it's also interesting, at least from what I've read from commentary, to acknowledge that Solomon was very young um, when he ascended to the throne. That, that, you know, from what I've read, it, they're estimating maybe 12 to 15. And so if it took seven years to build it, he's in his early 20s. But it's he's displaying such humility you know, as he's spreading out his hands towards heaven, you know, he gets on his knees and stood in, in the courts, you know, in front of the people. Um, he wasn't afraid like his father. He wasn't afraid to, to honor God. And, you know, as we read that long, beautiful prayer that he gives before all of Israel, you know, he's declaring to the people that their future hope wasn't resting on him that it was, he was pointing to God, that it's resting on God, you know, so he's, he's giving, God says he's not going to share his glory with another. So he was never exalting himself. I think that's important, you know, that he walked humbly before the Lord, um, at least in the early years. And um, he was publicly revealing to people that he was just the vessel that was being used by God. Um, Cause he was constantly through that prayer, exhorting people to forever you know, seek their guidance um, from the Lord, you know, to focus on him when things go wrong and to exalt him when things are favorable. Um, and, you know, and it was always, he was making sure they understood that it was to be about him and not themselves. And I just think, again, that just proves, of course, we know that he had, he received that wisdom, but there's just so many examples of it that we see through his life 
um, of, of the kind of man that he was and the wisdom that God had bestowed upon him to lead at such an early age in that way. Pastor Jed, I love the way that you uh, taught this uh, Bible study. I, I just love the, the way that you um, just expressed God's word in, in such easy terms for everyone to understand. But what I love is when you were talking about Solomon, and normally I have my video on, uh, Pastor Eric, so forgive me. Tonight is Struggle Town, USA, but normally I do have my video on. Um, but what I love, Pastor Jed, is when you said Renaissance man, we said it at the exact same time. I, I was like, what a Renaissance man, Solomon, and the light bulb went off. And I love reading about Solomon because you can see God's character because of the wisdom that God dropped into his brain, the beautiful, um, the beautiful wisdom, the holiness of God, but also the art and the beauty of God and his creation and um, the humility, everything, everything about it. And I love uh, Solomon's love for the people that when God came and said, ask, all he could think about was, how do I manage or love this great people of yours? And it's just one of my favorite stories. There's so many, but every time I read the Bible, something new comes. And I'm just so grateful for the way that you taught it and uh, just so blessed by it. Um, so just, I, I, I learn something every time I read the Bible. So thank you so much. That's very sweet. Thank you. It's a blessing to just learn together. And God's awesome. As, as we seek him for wisdom, just like Solomon did, he gives it. As the Bible says, if, any, if, if we lack wisdom, let him ask. God gives uh, to all who ask of him uh, So with right heart. So thank you, Chantel, and, and appreciate your heart. Um, and it's, it's interesting. When we get to Ecclesiastes, I love I love that book. I think Eric said the other day, it's his favorite book, actually. Um, I don't want to speak for you, brother, but I, I really like Ecclesiastes 2 and how, uh, you know, Solomon goes after everything. He says, look, I, I pursued every pursuit under heaven that, that one could pursue. Um, and so no one had the wealth that Solomon had. No one had the fame that Solomon had. I don't think anyone's had as many spouses as Solomon either, but that's another story. <laughs> but he pursues everything that you could possibly pursue. And he just lands on, you know what? Love God, love your work, love your spouse, basically. <laughs> and he keeps it simple. You know, I, I, I like it. And uh, Solomon, uh, like, we, like he, he's a man that, that loves truth. I guess that could be the 13th point on Solomon's character traits. You know, he's a man who loves the truth. He, loves, he, he he's pursuing what is true and he tries everything out there and he's searching for the answers and, and, and he's seeking God's help in that search. So, amen. Uh, other thoughts out there that anyone want to jump in on some of these questions? Yes, please. Um, I wanted to add one last thing about what I loved about Solomon was his attitude towards building God's temple. I mean, he gave God the best of the best and he did not hold back you know and so uh, I, I think that's a character that we all should uh, strive to have because um, I know oftentimes you know um, you know we want to give God we see that through, through through Genesis Cain and Abel their gifts you know uh, um, uh, uh, Cain uh, didn't give much uh, his best to God but Abel gave his best. Sorry if I mixed those those up, but uh, Abel gave God his best, you know, unblemished clean. And so, you know, the heart of Solomon um, to to do for God, it was really, I believe, uh, the standard on anything when you want to do uh, anything for God. Uh, so just to remember that uh, God will uh, be pleased when you give him your best because he knows your heart, uh, your, your heart uh, when you choose to give. I just love that example about Solomon. And if I may, I want to tag on with one other thing as well, just that I think we should not miss. Um, 
that God said to Solomon in the middle of the seven year building project. And it's in, in first Kings chapter six, verses 12 and 13. And he said, concerning this temple, you are building. If you keep all my decrees and regulations and obey all my commands, I will fulfill through you the promise I made to your father, David. I will live among the Israelites and I will never abandon my people, Israel. And I think what's important that we see in that is that God was in effect telling Solomon. And then in doing that, he was also telling the people that he was less concerned about the building and more concerned about them and their walk with him. And I just think that as we're looking at this lavish temple and all of the stuff that Solomon did, what was on God's heart still through it all was not that. It was their walk with him, you know, and their obedience to keep his way and to seek him with their whole heart. I think that point is so critical for us to understand, Krista, because obviously 586 BC, uh, the temple is sacked and Israel is going to end up going into captivity. And then Herod's temple gets rebuilt. Well, Herod, it's not Herod's temple, but the second temple gets built. Herod does a lot of uh, renovations on it in Jesus' time. That temple is the one that Jesus says, look, not one stone is going to be set on one another. Uh, and that, of course, is fulfilled in AD 70. And so we can look at, this is the house of God. God's not too concerned about that house, because as we know, he's raising up worshipers in spirit and in truth. And as the apostle Paul unfolds, believers, we are the house of God because we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And, and that's how much God is concerned about uh, how what you're talking about, Krista, which is walking with him in sincerity, truth, humility, wisdom. Uh, he wants to inhabit this. He wants to inhabit his people. That's the dream of God, not brick and mortar, not gold and silver, um, but the city not made by the hands of man, where Jesus and all tribes and the remnant from every tribe and tongue is together. That's the, the dream of God where it's the book of Revelation says he will be our God and we'll be his people. We won't need the sun or the moon because he will be our light. Um, and so buildings are going to come and go, even if they're grand and, you know, beautiful to behold. They don't exist today. Um, but God's house is go gaining more and more believers as the gospel of the kingdom goes to the four corners of the earth. Uh, and he's coming back uh, to consummate that kingdom. Uh, and so I think what you said is really important, that God wasn't, he's not like he's impressed. All the gold belongs to him. That's what he said in one of the Psalms we read this week, right? I don't need bulls and goats. I don't, need, I don't eat the, 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 the meat. I don't drink the blood. I don't need it. I have cattle on a thousand hills. I own the earth. God created everything in the earth. He's not impressed. Um, but he does love us and he does want us to walk with him. So I love that point. Thank you, Krista. Amen. I would Amen. like to add something in that and really uh, look at how, I think in essence, I know that it grieves God and we should be grieved in reference to um, most of the gospel today, particularly in prosperity, and that it has it misconstrued. And that is that more emphasis is put on, you know, the gold, the silver, the diamonds, the beautiful buildings and all of that stuff. But, you know, God uses gold as asphalt, literally, because the streets are paved in gold. And so therefore, something that we're walking on, we are now, there's a culture that that's what everybody is seeking and looking for instead of the true blessing and the true gift. And that is to fellowship, to commune. The, the thing that is eternal is our relationship, the love, the walk with him. That's the most valuable thing. And when God sees us, and Jed, to your point, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
And what does he want? He tells us that we should walk in integrity. We should walk in righteousness. We should walk in him. That's the most valuable thing. And really bringing the culture back to the understanding that the thing that God value most is not, uh, you know, buildings are great, but they are temporary. They're not eternal. You can have the grandest of the grandest cathedral, the grandest of the grandest church or whatever, but that's not, and God demonstrated that over and over again. That's why he didn't hesitate when he needed to bring correction. Those buildings went down, the temple went down first time, second time. God is saying, that's not the greatest resource. The greatest resource and the treasure that I have is my creation that loves me, that wants to uh, commune with me, obey me. We must go back and reevaluate what the priorities are. We must go back and reevaluate what is the important things and help people to refocus because somewhere along the line from Solomon's days, even with Christ, we've messed this thing up and people are focusing on something that is not God's desire, you know? Well, to me, when you say that, and I know I said I'd zip my lips, so I apologize, but I couldn't help myself. So I, it makes me think of Matthew 7, where straight is the way, narrow is the gate, and few that find it, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many are on it. You know, and it's true what you're saying. Um, it is a difficult path. It is, a, you know, it's not the um, all about me and my best life now. It's just, that's not truth. Amen. And I believe that we're in a season and a time as we continue to read the word and God is causing more people to seek him, to have a love for his word and to love truth, to love truth. So we can no longer walk in error, but walk in the truth of the word of God. And he, I believe, is raising up a generation that is desperate for the truth and long to hear it. And they're not in it for what God can do for them. They're in it for who he is and how they can relate to this great God. And what can we do for our God? And not as robots, but people who have a heart and a love for God and really understanding that the temporary things are the temporary things, but the eternal things are the things of God. And that is more than, you know, my current finances, the greatest and the biggest house and all of that stuff. God is not into the stuff. He's into heart to heart. So it is a heart-to-heart -heart connection. He reveals his heart to us. And in responding, that other stuff just comes. But that's not what we should be seeking and longing for. It's him. And Solomon gets this. He's in this place because he has an example. David stored up so many things for God. Solomon didn't have to try to figure out, oh, what should I do? He saw his father's example and because it did not mean anything to his father, God was more, God was more precious and greater. Solomon followed suit until he got blindsided down the road. But initially he's coming into this thing with the same aspiration, inspiration, desire that he saw David set for him all of his life. Did David make mistakes? Yes, but David's admiration, David's priority of God was foremost. And that's why David went about ensuring that the goal and all of the other things, the treasures, and even having his men to give unto this temple and, uh, and pass that desire on to his son. Here's my point. It's generational, and we need to make sure that we're teaching 
and training. The Bible says, teach a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it. If we set the example of God being first and foremost, Terrence spoke about giving God our very best. Jed, you spoke about doing your very best and accomplishing what God uh, has uh, ordained or designed for us to do. That is an act of love that comes in deep devotion and worship. And it's something that is seen and can be passed on from generation to generation. Amen. That was beautiful. Thank you, Pastor Sylvia. Um, any other thoughts out there? Any, anyone get anything from the Psalms that we were reading through? We've read through quite a number of them. I think about 11 or 12 Psalms. Um, I don't know if any of those, uh, I want to leave a little room uh, tonight if anyone wants to touch on any of those themes. There's a lot that's in there. Um, <laughs> so any thoughts out there uh, from anyone else? Okay, okay I got to say something else. I'm sorry, you brought up the Psalms. What can I say? So Psalms 50 uh, Pastor Sylvia and I were talking about this together, actually, when we were in Kansas City, we were reading through Psalm 50, and I just think it's quite profound what we find at verse 16 on a little bit further, but it says, but God says to the wicked, why bother reciting my decrees? So these are obviously people who are in the word. Why bother reciting my decrees and pretending to obey my covenant for you refuse my discipline and treat my words like trash. When you see thieves, you approve of them and you spend your time with adulterers. So, um, well, I'll continue on, just finish this out. Your mouth is filled with wickedness and your tongue is full of lies. You sit around and slander your brother, your mother's own son. While you did all this, I remained silent and you thought I didn't care. But now I will rebuke you, listing all my charges against you. Repent, all of you who forget me, or I will tear you apart, and no one will be there to help you. I mean, that in itself, wow. we could probably finish this meeting just talking about that. That is serious. These are the words of God, you know, and he's, this is a strong rebuke for someone who's reading the word of God, pretending, because God sees our heart, you know, that, and he's, you know, you're pretending to obey, but he knows, you know, and you're Citing my words as if you really believe all of this, but you're not, ref you're refusing my discipline. You're treating my words like trash. And to me, I feel like I, I, I like test myself with this word. You know what I mean? Like we should all, the Bible, Paul says, test yourself, make sure you're truly in the faith. But you know, this is a word to someone who thinks they're a brother or a sister, you know, but they're not according to the Lord. And interesting verse 18, I had someone recently give me what they believed their rev the revelation was on this when it says when you see thieves you approve of them and he's saying when you this person it was a just anyway just a person that shared with me what they believed the spirit was saying and they said they believed that meant when you see someone stealing god's word and using it for profit like ministers who are huckstering with god's word and you're approving of them so when you see thieves and you approve of them basically stealing his word to capitalize on the gospel and you're still listening to all of this as if it's okay. Do you know what I mean? It was just really like, I think there's just really something strong here from the Lord, Lord, a word of caution for us um, to make sure that we are not treating his words like trash. And to me, it's like, you know, he's so serious about this word. It's supposed to be doing something. It's supposed to be something we value, like the greatest treasure we've ever found because it is wisdom. Jesus said, this word is your very life. It's your very life. You know, that this can't just be some casual thing that you just think they're recommendations for your life. This is commands of God. And we've got to get just as serious about it and understanding what he means. Like when he's saying this stuff, that we truly need to um, be repentant before God when we're not, um, when we're just not moved by this, you know, when this isn't wrecking us, when we read it or we're not searching our own hearts and just getting real before the Lord because he's searching our heart and he knows anyway, might as well tell him if you're faking it, 
you know? And if, if you, I think if we do find ourselves, oh, I put myself there. Like if we do find ourselves in a place where we're not properly applying the word or we're not motivated to obey it, I believe that's where the Holy Spirit will help us. We have to ask him for the help, you know? And to me, I think that's like, it's not a place that we can be, we're destitute. There's hope because God will help us. He's the one who he says he's in, the Holy Spirit is in our, our enabler. He's going to enable us to keep the word but we've got to ask because he also says you have not because you ask not. So anyway, just something that I thought was really profound as I was reading the word. And like I said, Pastor Sylvia and I were kind of mulling over that. And here we are, you know, talking about it. So it's in this week's reading. So it had to come out. <laughs> yes. And I just wanted to say, uh, Krista, as well, when I was reading, I came across that psalm and I said to my husband, uh, you, I, will you listen to this? And he said, yes. And I read the whole Psalm because I said, that's God. Wow. And it just really spoke to me about everything. It just, it all came alive. And that's something that I ask for every day is, um, God search my heart, help me Holy Spirit. Uh, to walk in, in the way of righteousness, show me the path, just help me, help me, lead me, guide me. And one thing that I always say to God is, thank you, dear Jesus, for a heart of repentance. Mm. Thank you for keeping my heart a heart of flesh. But this Psalm 2 spoke so clearly, I had to read this out loud. And I did the same thing, Krista. So I just wanted to, to say that. Amen. And I just noticed I didn't read the last verse because I think this one's poignant, but it says, but giving thanks is a sacrifice that truly honors me. God wants a thankful, grateful heart in us. And he says, if you keep my path, I will reveal to you the salvation of God. Now that's a deep one too, to meditate on that. What does that mean, Lord, that you're going to reveal to me the salvation of God? You know, I mean, I think, I think we could have a long conversation about that one, but we, you know, we are not yet saved. We're on the way to salvation, which is why Paul said we're nearer our salvation than we were before. You know, we're nearer to it. Our, the Holy Spirit's been given to us as a deposit, as a down payment, but we're not saved yet, which is why, you know, the Bible talks about the, those who are backslidden and, you know, that if you turn a, a brother or sister from their sin, that you save a soul from death. You know, we're not, we can't just... Con like trample underfoot the blood of the covenant that sanctified us, counting it as a common thing. Basically, that's what scriptures say in Hebrews, that there's going to be a judgment for that, you know? And so um, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So we've got to continue. This is what he said. He said, if, if you keep to my path, that's how we can know we're safe. That's how we can know we're on the path of righteousness. We're on the path of salvation, and we know that we're testing ourselves, you know, that we're walking with him. We're abiding in Christ. That doesn't mean you're a perfect person, that you still may slip and sin, but you're quick to repent when you do. You don't squelch the Holy Spirit. You respond to the Holy Spirit and acknowledge, I just sinned, and I'm going to try to correct what, I, what the Lord has pointed out to me because I want to make it right with God, and I want my hands to be clean. You know, that we're in that process of sanctification, by this word, doing the work in us. But to me, I'm just, I don't know that I, it resonates in me because I just feel like we can sit here and meet on Monday nights and give lip service to this word. And it can do nothing for us if we're not really getting real about how serious God is about us applying this word to ourselves, you know? And like he says, what, don't pretend, don't pretend you know, recite these things and pretend that to obey my covenant, he knows. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Praise the Lord. But I think, the, um, and you, and we did talk about it when you were in Kansas City, and it's a very important thing that needs to be highlighted because it is these particular things, and I will not say blanketly that no one discusses, but it's one of those areas that seem to be overlooked. We focus on the blessings, the blessing, and they are numerous. But the important thing you said, if, 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 
if, you know, they apply to those that are walking in this. We should even have a greater appreciation for the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit brings the conviction. That's how we know that we are in him. He brings the conviction. We're not trying to say that any of us have arrived because we have not which means that we are perfected in Christ, but we are not perfect. And so we will miss the mark. You know, it's like when I used to do weapons qualification, you know, they would take us out on the range and we would have uh, to do the preliminaries and they would tell us to hit it center mass. Well, I would try, but there were times when I did not. I would hit the target at the top of his head. Other times they were still trying to figure out where my bullet went. You know, where did I, where did it hit? It hit anywhere. But I wasn't because I wasn't trying to aim at it, but I would miss the mark. And that's what God is saying to us that I realize you're going to miss the mark. But when you miss the mark, my spirit leads you. And as Chantel said, with that spirit of repentance, then we come back, we repent. And guess what? He said, they'll focus again and begin to try to aim center mass again. And the more we keep doing it, then we're able to hit center mass. You know, we had to zero our weapon. That's where I'm going on that. We had to zero our weapon. You couldn't just pick it up and start shooting and think you're going to hit something. But the zero would tell you how close you were to center mass. And if you were off, then they would go in and adjust your front sight and your rear sight. This is for the M16. We had other weapons and stuff. But in that adjustment, the windage would bring you back to the center mass. So what are we doing every day? We're every day in the Holy Spirit trying to allow him to make those tweaks, those adjustments, those alignments, so that we can come into center mass walking in the truth of God's word, living for him, no longer for ourselves. And when we miss it, you know, uh, when we miss it, be quick to make those adjustments. Because literally, when we would go out to zero our weapon, if you did not zero your weapon, you could be there all day. But if you listen to what they were saying, the, the uh, drill sergeants or whomever, and you made the adjustments they made, it would bring you in because we had to get three holes in a row and that was your center mass. Amen. I hope that made some kind of sense and you all followed what I said. Amen. Praise the Lord. Loved it. Praise the Lord. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Thank you for that. It's, I, love the, I love what we're talking about. I would just I felt feel led to add this. I was listening to some Derek Prince teachings this week. Phenomenal uh, man of God, very good teacher. I'd never heard his his message before. He's he's with the Lord now, but um, he has it's a four part series. If you want to go on YouTube, you can find it yourself. But it's Derek Prince, and it's Who Am I? Part one, part two, part three, and part four. Really excellent theology on some of what we're talking about here. It's really helpful to me to, un to hear him talk about when we're created, you know, the triune God makes man and male and female in his image, spirit, soul, and body. And he talks about how the spirit is in the Hebrew, it's the word ruach. God breathed into Adam, formed him out of the clay. That's the body part. Uh, and then in the, in the middle is the soul. God gave mankind a living soul. And the way that, that Derek talks about it, I think what we're articulating here is your spirit is wanting to go Godward. Your flesh is wanting to go into carnality. And your soul is that which is being either brought under the subjection of the spirit to obey the spirit, or your soul is being brought under the subjection of the flesh to follow the gratification of the flesh. So the apostle Paul talks about the flesh and the spirit are at war with one another. And so the soul is made up of your mind, your, your intellect, your will, and your emotions. I think, I feel, and I want. <laughs> and so that's the soul. When you 
And the soul is what is, as we are being disciplined and sanctified as being, uh, as we yield and surrender ourselves, that soul gets more and more surrendered to the Holy Spirit. And you have something like in Psalm 103, where David says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. So the spirit is telling the soul, you need to bless the Lord. And then his body, his mouth, his hands, maybe he's falling prostrate before the Lord. His body is responding to the soul's directive, if this makes sense. So your soul is going to be directed towards the things of the spirit or will be directed to the things of the flesh. Um, and that's what we're talking about here is bringing every day, every thought captive to the word of God and allowing our minds to be renewed, presenting our bodies as living sacrifice, Romans 12, where you know God's wanting, why did he give us a body? Well, your body is a temple. It's a temple of the Holy Spirit. We can glorify God in how we operate in our bodies, believe it or not. And so there's a lot of purpose. Some Christians teach the body is evil and materialistic, and there's nothing good in the physical realm. That's actually not what the Bible teaches. Um, there's a reason why he gave us a body. And in fact, we're going to have a resurrected body for eternity, and we'll be glorifying God in that, in that body. And then we won't have the same... Uh, we won't have a, a, a carnal nature to fight against. So anyway, all of that to say is we're wrestling these things through, like Krista said, like we can't just uh, engage in the, the God doesn't want us to have an intellectual only exercise where the words go in one ear and out the other. He wants us to be changed and that the word of God is like that mirror that the apostle James says, don't be like someone who looks at themselves in the mirror and then doesn't change. But the Bible shows us who we really are, and then we are to apply the word. And so just like, you know, if your hair's messed up or your clothes are messed up or you've got salad in your teeth or whatever, you, you go to a mirror and you make the appropriate changes. And through the Holy Spirit's conviction, as we read the Bible, he is going to be sanctifying us and teaching us uh, as, and I think what Sylvia just said, is the same concept, the adjustments to be made so that we can track and hit the mark. Say. You know, the Holy Spirit's the one that convicts. And I, I tell people, you know, when I got saved, there was all the sin that I was conscious of, like if as if I had like a hundred watt light bulb in my life, like, oh man, I'm dirty. And God's like, okay, we'll unscrew that. We'll put the 500 watt light bulb in. Oh my gosh. And how much more do you see by the light of revelation? Oh my gosh, I'm really dirty, really super sinful. Let's, let's, okay, Lord, make some adjustments. Okay, let's put the 1,000 watt light bulb in. And, and then you, the closer you get to a holy God, by definition, the more aware and conscious you're going to be of how little, how we don't deserve his grace. We don't deserve his mercy. It's through no merit of our own. And we are sinful in our flesh. And as the Bible says, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Um, but if we can bring our bodies into line, our souls into line with that spirit, we can be a temple for the living God. Amen. Well, I will pray us out and uh, appreciate everybody. Thank you all for coming on again. It's always good to be together around the word. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for your word. And I'm reminded, Lord, even as I pray about uh, Oswald Chambers, you said, don't measure your Christian walk by what happened yesterday, but look at where you were uh, a year ago. And Lord, we know that you're a God of seasons and you change us over time and you're conforming us to the image of your son. So I just pray you would help us as we uh, chew on your word and we digest it and you're showing us different things. We may have read through the Bible a uh, hundred times, but you show us new things. Lord, we just thank you for wisdom. We thank you for revelation. And as Solomon prayed, Lord, um, we ask for wise and discerning hearts that you would be our wisdom, that, that you would lead and guide us in our, in our families, in our workplaces, in, our, in the communities you've called us to have influence in. Lord, that we would represent your kingdom. We would represent Jesus. Uh, we would represent your love um, truthfully and honestly, and that, Lord, you would change and recalibrate our hearts, and our, that we could have hearts, that we could love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Um, because you are worthy and you're the creator. We are the ones that you have created in your image. And so we bless you. We thank you. Pray your blessings on each person and family represented. 
on Bread for the Journey and those that couldn't join us tonight. We pray your blessings over them as well. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. We'll see you back next Monday night, Lord willing. And don't forget, tell your friends, invite your friends on this journey. We'd love to have more come into the body and to this fellowship of um, believers that are meeting, you know, all of us from different places. So it's just wonderful to welcome in new people. So please don't be shy about inviting anybody that you, the Lord brings into your heart. God bless you all. Shalom.